will uh, make a much more dynamic painting than one that's just consistently blue. Same with red, green, yellow, anything you want. Um, I also think using complements of colors gives a vibration to your paintings that's not there otherwise. Uh, one color sings off the other. But that gets into my whole number one story thing, which is all about uh, the uh, tension. I don't like that word tension. I don't like to be tense. But there's a tension in paintings that I think an artist can play with. The um, complements of color, yes, warm, cool, but also complements of value, dark, light. Complements of uh, the composition, vertical versus horizontal. All these two uh, opposing factors enter into almost every painting and have to find some resolution. And that's the fun part of being an artist. You get to play around with that. There are sort of endless ways of, of doing it. You can have a dominantly vertical painting and have nothing horizontal if you want, but often just throwing in one tiny horizontal in an overall dominantly vertical painting will really make it uh, obvious what you're up to. But anyway, that's getting into philosophy. So it's story, composition, value, color. That's my hierarchy. Uh, it doesn't need to be yours, but um, but to get there, because value is so important to me, before I start a painting, which I'll do outside, not in here, I will almost always do a very quick value study because, with very few exceptions, all of the lightest lights in my paintings are almost always saved whites of the paper. They're unpainted areas, which is another tension painted versus the unpainted. Um, intellectual types like to talk about music as the spaces between the notes, or poetry about the blank spaces between the words. And I think there's truth there, and I think it's the same in a painting. A good painting, especially a good watercolor, I think, is the, um, the resolution, or lack thereof, of the painted areas versus the unpainted areas. Um, for me, saving the white of the paper works so well as a, as a trick, as an approach, better word, because it shows, uh, it shows the root, it shows where you come from. The blank sheet of the paper, and it's also the whitest white, the lightest light. It's, it can make all the other uh, brights, all the other darks in your painting really come across so beautifully. Again, I look at a lot of otherwise good paintings where all the light is gone, where the artist has taken a brush and just painted the entire surface of the painting. I'm not gonna say that's wrong, that can work, but I think you've already uh, crippled yourself a little bit because you've taken away all the light, you've taken away all the whites. So every other value you put on that painting is gonna have to be that much darker, that much stronger. And if you save a little bit of pure paper untouched, then your job's just going to be easier. So I call watercolor subtractive because any tone, any color you put on your paper subtracts away from the ultimate amount of white, the light that you have to work with. You can always go in and take away white later, but you really can't add it. Uh, unless you start going in with opaque paints, and then the next thing you know, you're painting in acrylics and the game is lost. I don't mind little bits of opaque in a painting, just for the record, nothing wrong with it at all. I'm not a purist, but, but a transparent medium does rely on transparency on the paper showing through. So yeah, you can always take away white, but it's much more difficult to add it back later. You either have to wash it, scrub it, or add it with opaque, uh, nothing wrong with any of those. But it's just, for me, not quite as shimmering and effective as if you save the light to begin with. <clears throat> Almost all of my brushes are made by the great Escoto. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Um, I would buy them even regardless. They are the best, and I've tried all of them. It's a... I think they're coming, I hope they are.
They're great guys, but they're a great company. They do a lot of work for artists. They talk to artists. They're involved with artists. They know paintings. They know painters. And it reflects in the quality of the products that they make. Um, they're not in it just for the money. I'm sure they want to make a, they want to pay their bills, but they know what they're doing, and they're always tweaking their uh, brushes to make them better, and always experimenting. But they make such beautiful brushes. Um, I like the Mops, these Aquario series. Uh, they're natural bristles, mostly squirrel because they both hold a point and because they're natural hair, they hold a lot of water. So you can go over a very large painting with one of the mid-size or large mops without the brush running out of paint and pigment, which it would do with a more synthetic brush often. You'd have to stop, reload the brush, and go back. But a natural hair brush, you can cover big areas very quickly and fluidly. Um, so these mops are great for me because I work so wet. I use them all the time. I'm a little bit addicted to them. The Aquario series for me are my favorite, the best. Um, in addition, I use these Escoda Versatiles. I never stop using these. Um, Escoda is trying to produce, I'm kind of eager to speak with them, but a type of brush that's synthetic, but behaves more like a natural hair. So even though it's synthetic fibers, it holds a lot of water. So it's very encouraging. I'm from Southern California and not only like yoga, but I don't like Kalinsky brushes because I feel bad for, for the poor sables. <laughs> Whereas I understand no squirrels were harmed in the production of these squirrel hair mops. But no, they're Kalinsky brushes that are phenomenally beautiful, but they're very expensive. I don't know this in this day and age whether they're really worth all that money because you can get amazing brushes for a fraction of the cost that behave just, just as well. Um, so they make a Prado series that's phenomenal, which I love. The Versatiles, which I really, really love. All rounds. Although I do have this one flat that I occasionally use. It's an Escoda Versatile. And then they make this series of uh, Escoda Perla. They're all synthetic. And I use these in uh, a 12, an 8, and a 4 size more for smaller areas. Beautiful point, so for trees, people, little shadows, beautiful line work, calligraphy. Uh, these Perla brushes are gorgeous, I think. Top shelf brushes and they're uh, really, for the kind of quality they are, they're not that expensive. They're well worth it. And I've had these for many years. I use them every day of my life and they, they hold up beautifully. Um, I have a billion brushes. I only brought a few because I find that I only use in most paintings maybe four brushes, tops, sometimes only one or two. But I always have one of these guys. It's also a Skoda, it's a rigger, meaning it has um, very long bristles that come out from the ferrule. And these are especially useful for calligraphy, for tree branches, power lines, or any kind of wires you want to, lines you want to put in a painting. Uh, little smaller shadows, uh, signing your name, very important. But any kind of line work, one of these, I don't know that they're absolutely required, but I can't quite imagine traveling without one of these. I use it all the time. And those are the main brushes I use. I have a million others at home, but um, a mop I think is essential, a really good quality round, and a rigger. And I, uh, just for security, always have one flat. This is sort of a medium sized, three quarter inch. And I could do almost any painting, any size with, uh, with these brushes. I do have one of these too. It's also an Escoda. Altimo series. It's a big 
flat. Um, these are sometimes useful if they're moist. You can smooth out a big wash in the sky or water or something like that. I don't use it a great deal, but it's a very uh, useful brush to have on hand for that. Uh, you could use it to do a very big sky, but I find the mop works just about as well for really laying in big juicy washes. So, but I like these two. So, those are uh, brushes and paper. I use 300 gram or in pounds 140 pound paper almost exclusively. Thinner, I find, uh, doesn't have enough tooth for me. Thicker paper I can use sometimes, but I find the thick paper, even though it can have a beautiful grain, if it's soft, will tend to soak the pigment in a little bit. <clears throat> Saunders 300 pound, really like a sponge. I've done very nice paintings, I think, on them. I'll go to bed all proud and smug, and I'll get up in the morning and look at it and think, what's happened? All the paint has vanished. But overnight, it just soaks in the pigment. So uh, the 140 pound doesn't do that as much. That said, I do have 300 pound back in the studio. I use it occasionally for paintings where I might want uh, an atmospheric effect, clouds or fog or rain, something like that. 